Well, hello everybody. It was a matter of time, wasn't it, before we all started talking about flexible wings in Formula One once more. And of course, at the Spanish Grand Prix, that's exactly what's happened. And the paddock is awash with discussions about who's got a flexible wing or who has not, and the difference they all make. Well, I thought it was a good opportunity to take a look at what flexible wings in motor racing, and particularly Formula One, are all about. A Formula One wing works a little bit like an upside down aircraft wing and it generates downforce rather than lift. Downforce when the car's going down the straight isn't particularly helpful. While it sticks the car to the road very nicely in the corners, it also generates a lot of aerodynamic drag and that slows you down as you go down the straights. So what teams have done over the years is find ways to make their wings deform under aerodynamic loads in such a way that the shape of the wing is almost changing as the cars go down the straights, reducing the aerodynamic drag. And then when the driver hits the brakes, slows the car down, the wings pop up back into position, generating maximum downforce and giving maximum grip through the corner. But this isn't strictly speaking allowed. The Formula One technical regulations say that all aerodynamic devices, the front and rear wing, must be immobile and rigidly secured to the car at all times. Now, that essentially means flexible wings are banned and they've been banned for a very long time with the exception of DRS on the rear wing, which is a different case. However, any engineer will tell you that perhaps the headlines aren't the full story in the real world is a little bit different when it comes to practicality. When you design a wing, be it for a racing car or even for an airliner, you will have some degree of flexibility regardless of what you do. These wings generate huge amounts of load, particularly on the tips, on the outer elements and the upper edges. So these wings are being physically forced down by that air rushing under and over them and they're being sucked to the ground in some cases. And that's gonna cause some degree of flexibility. So the Formula One technical regulations actually allow for some degree of flexibility on both the front and the rear wing, and of course the lower beam wing as well. Depending on which bit of the wing you're looking at, the FIA has different tolerances. Some bits of the wing can only flex by two millimeters, and other bits can flex by up to 20 millimeters, depending on which bit of the car you're looking at. Similar situation on the floor of the car as well. To police this, the FIA have a whole series of tests where they essentially dangle big old weights on different bits of the wing. And one area they particularly look at is the upper surface of the front wing. They put these weights on the upper surface and see just how much that wing deforms. And it depends if they put the weights on one side or on both sides. And it's something teams have been playing with for an awfully long time. The problem for the FIA is quite a tricky one because they do all of their wing testing with the car in mobile sat in the FIA garage. And in fact, if you do the front wing test, they take the entire front wing assembly off the car, put it into the test rig, and then apply the weights. That's how it's done. So there isn't even a car involved in some of those tests. When it's on the rear wing, they apply weights to the rear wing when it's all bolted onto the car as well. And this creates that big issue for the FIA because testing a car or bits of a car in a garage is very different to seeing how the wing performs at 300 kph as the car goes down the straight. And it's not really practical for an FIA scrutineer to check what the wings are doing as the car is at full speed, not least for safety reasons and aerodynamic reasons. It's not great to have a scrutineer hanging onto the front suspension with a vernier caliper seeing how much the wing elements move. That's not gonna happen in reality, is it? So there are a few other devices on the car that do check for wing flexibility. If you look at the rear wing of the car, for example, you'll see an array of white dots on the different elements of the rear wing and the lower beam wings. And those dots are calibrated to the rear facing onboard camera. So the FI can check the degrees of movement of that wing on a consistent measure. So that's one way the FI is checking for the wing movements at the back of the car at speed. And then they can also look on the onboard cameras looking forwards as the cars are going round the track as well. None of these tech checks are perfect, of course, because there is that degree of flexibility allowed in the regulations. And those regulations define how flexible is too flexible. And that's where the real debate is coming in. Do any teams have wings that are slightly too flexible? Well, F1 teams have spent an awful lot of energy and time on this exact issue, designing their wing structures to be as flexible as the rules allow to maximize that performance increase you get from the wing flattening out at speed. 
However, this is a hugely complex process involving the le different layup of the carbon fiber in the wings and different parts of the wing. And when I say layup, it's, it's a bit like a high fashion clothing manufacturer where there's different layers of carbon fiber materials, different cores inside these front wings and all sorts of different clever structures and a huge amount of computational power put into studying how the different plies are applied to the front wing and how that affects the wing under load. Well, for the 2024 season and more recently, the FIA have actually legislated how those plies are applied and also limited on what the teams can do. The teams also have to report it back to the FIA so the FIA can run its own simulation. So the FIA is really watching very closely what the teams are doing with their wing construction. Nonetheless, we did hear from the FIA at the start of the season that they were a little bit concerned about what some teams were doing with the lower beam wings, for example. So maybe there was a bit too much flexibility in those parts and they upgraded the, che upgraded the checks and studied some of the different sections that they were doing on those parts of the wing. So it is a big, difficult structure. But F1 teams aren't just gonna be looking at their own wings and each other's wings as we go through the Spanish Grand Prix weekend. They're also gonna be looking at the wings of other teams and as well as other parts. This being Spanish Grand Prix, there's an awful lot of new bits to see. Well, at least normally. Barcelona means upgrades, and normally every team brings a huge upgrade package to the Spanish circuit, or the Catalan circuit if you like. However, this year seems a bit different. Maybe it's the effect of the cost cap, or maybe it's the regulations maturing, but only three teams have bought major upgrade packages, V-Carb, Ferrari, and Red Bull Racing. We're gonna take a closer look at Red Bull when they get to their home circuit in Austria next week. However, I think we need to understand the first reason is, why do teams normally bring big upgrade packages to the Spanish circuit? One man who knows the answer to that question is Ferrari's Jock Clear. Asking the questions, Mike Seymour. Hi Jock, good to see you. Uh, we saw quite a sizable list of updates on the Ferrari for this weekend. Just wondered if you could talk us through them, please. Yeah, um, Barcelona, traditionally, uh, a, a, a a very solid base on which to bring a car. It's one of those circuits where uh, you, you're not going to be competitive unless you've got a good all-round car package. So actually it's the ideal place to bring a, an upgrade. We talked about some of our upgrades earlier in the year and when you have to basically balance the, the stress of the weekend over how much you think you're going to learn. You come to Barcelona, the stress is low, you know, we know the circuit very well, we know everything about the circuit and we're really comfortable here, so you bring an upgrade here, you're going to get a good read on it. Well, let's turn our attention to some of those upgrades and the first thing I want to take a look at is rear wings. Sauber has bought a new rear wing to this circuit, as has V-Carb. And the reason I want to highlight these two teams, not least as we saw earlier, those dots on the rear wing, but take a look at how those rear wings worked in practice. Look at the top of this rear wing on the Sauber. You can see it fluttering away when the DRS is open. Now the wing should absolutely not do that. And there is a risk that that wing could get called in to the pits if it did it in the race. But it's also causing a huge aerodynamic disturbance behind the car. This isn't the first time we've seen this effect on a car. You may remember a while back Red Bull Racing having that problem or Max Verstappen's car in particular. And also the Alpha Towery team before it turned into VCarb had a few problems with that as well. And it's not the first time we even saw it this weekend because as we mentioned, VCarb had suffered from this problem before. Check this out on the newly upgraded car of Yuki Tsunoda, that new rear wing. Watch what happens when the car reaches its top speed with the DRS open as it goes over the crest on the start finish straight in Barcelona. Just, you can start to see it going there. The loads build up across the wing surface and flutter, 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 flutter. Both teams had to take the cars back into the pits and make some adjustments, but they both got them working before the end of FP1, but it cost them a little bit of time. Not really what you want, but Spanish Grand Prix not being a sprint, lots of free practice time available. And sticking on the topic of v -Carb, they've introduced quite a substantial upgrade package to their car, including revised inlets to the side pods. Now this is a big change actually, and it leads me to suspect there's been quite a lot of changes that we can't see underneath the bodywork such as the ducting behind the radiator panels and ahead of the radiators, 
and all the way underneath the side pods. And the side pods themselves have been completely reshapen. And it's not just the inlet, it's the whole side pod that's different. And actually you can see it, it's not the clearest thing when you look at the new version in isolation, but actually this whole section here completely reshaped for the team. And that's a fundamental change. And all the stuff underneath the side pod, because the top section's been re reshaped ever so slightly as well, all the stuff underneath it, that's been reshaped. I wonder if they've changed the radiators as well, the heat exchangers, the coolers that sit underneath the bodywork, I suspect they probably have. And that comes without a little bit of a wind tunnel penalty as well, so you can get away with that. And then of course they've changed that element of the side pod. So the link between the side pod and the floor, that's all changed. New floor edge for the team as well. This is a massive upgrade for the car. Didn't look like it was working particularly clearly in FP1, but they were still learning, and also learning to make that rear wing work properly. At the front, these funny bits, the floor edge wing, as people, some people call them. Um, this section here, completely reshapen. There's a little step there. That's, a re, that's been remodified, that's been changed. So a little bit of an adjustment there. Minor change, possibly a big impact that has an effect on everything downstream of it. So all of that airflow management, particularly key. One thing that has amused me though is the front air scoop on the brake duct for V-Carb. The FIA regulations say that all teams have to notify them of all visible upgrades. But once you've used an upgrade, you don't have to notify anybody when, when you use it again. VCUB seems to have misunderstood this because these brake ducts were used earlier in the season. They've reintroduced them after Monaco and Canada and brought them back and they declared it as an upgrade. But the, actually, this is a brake duct they've already used. So they've misunderstood the regulations ever so slightly but we still like to show it because, well, it's nice of them to tell us, isn't it? Moving on, but staying in the Italian corner though, let's take a look at Ferrari. Now, Ferrari's upgrade package is less obvious. It's quite a subtle upgrade package, but I suspect quite a significant one. The most obvious thing you're gonna see is they've slightly reshaped this element that sticks out alongside the rear halo mount. Now, this section is something that is pretty unique to Ferrari. They've been playing around with it. Earlier in the season, you'll remember they had a cooling outlet just down here, but with the large upgrade package they had earlier in the season, that was deleted and replaced with this little sort of, I don't know, upside, upside down L shape, it's, or an R shape, if you like. That's sitting there, and they've just tweaked the shape of it ever so slightly will have an effect on everything downstream, but it's an area that other teams haven't yet fully exploited. I expect to see a bit more play from other teams on this. But the real secret of the Ferrari upgrade package, you can see sort of in this image. The car has a completely new floor on it. So the whole floor edge has been revised. Some pretty interesting details around here. Pretty standard for the current status quo in Formula One. It's pretty much the state of the art. Everybody's doing similar sorts of trends in this area. I mean. This forward section reminds me a little bit of what Mercedes were doing last year and a little bit this year. But the real significant thing actually is the shape of the side pod edge. There's a more significant undercut that's underneath that shell logo. It goes in a little bit more. That's managing the airflow all the way along the side of the car to the inside edge of the rear wheels. Really critical area, really sensitive area of the car. And also exposing more of the upper surface of the floor. Hard to say exactly what they're getting from it without sticking the real car into a wind tunnel or CFD. And oddly enough, they won't let me do that, even though I'd really quite like to. But that is something that Ferrari will have done an awful lot of work on. And again, reshaping the side pod probably means those coolers that sit underneath this section of bodywork they've all been reworked as well. Doesn't come out of your wind tunnel allocation to do that, as I said before, but a big change for Ferrari. And then a slightly more conventional change for the Italian team, new rear wing, sort of thing you see progressively through the season. Ferrari seem to think this is part of a new suite of rear wings. So they're gonna have a few more wings based around this design. And I think the area to really keep an eye on as the car develops is this wing tip area. And we've seen it on quite a few cars as they've developed new little devices in this area, opened up a little bit of freedom in the regulations. And I think that and these little link sections up here, that's where you're gonna see big development. So I think there's more to come from Ferrari on this rear wing. And then looking from the rear end of the car, it's a bit of a dark image here because it was in the shadows. They've been mucking about with the diffuser design of the car. And again, part of their complete redesign of the floor of the car. And that's the really powerful part of the downforce generation on a Formula One car. But not all of the details and upgrades in Barcelona are such big things. 
One of the little details that I really like to see introduced was this on the Haas, just a little aero flick up, almost like a spoiler that you'd get on uh, an old NASCAR or something like that. This, uh, and of course that's rather fitting being Haas, who have just announced they're leaving NASCAR. That was a surprise to me. But you could see this little spoiler here, this little flick up section here. This follows the trend introduced by Aston Martin of mucking about with the elements at the rear of the car. Haas are the first team other than Aston Martin to really exploit the little technical freedom you have around this part of the car. However, Haas has not opted to develop this part of the car that, like Aston Martin did because that has quite an impact on how you do your pit stops. Because if you change this lower section of the car, you're gonna have to modify your rear jack and that can have a really detrimental effect on pit stops. And if you're having a really close battle in the pits and in the Constructors' Championship, losing a bit of time in the pits, that's really gonna cost you points overall. So little details and big details on display up and down the pit lane in Barcelona. I suspect there's an awful lot more to come as the teams work their way through Austria and Silverstone and get their way towards the summer break because this is going to be a very closely fought season of Formula One.